Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe. I'm just reading the chat, which is a, a great idle pastime here, folks. If you haven't had chances to read these chats, I hope when we post the sessions, you will, because they're fantastic and full of all sorts of interesting uh, comments and perspectives, but also references. And so I see, for instance, that uh, Panita is plugging the International Music Cities Convention, which is being hosted in Alberta next week, next uh, month, it looks like, right? And that she'll be emceeing from Edmonton day two. Uh, so she's put a link in there. And then Alice Castleman's put in a project that she's working on. So, you know, we are discouraging of people putting things in here that are self-promotional, obviously. So you'll notice if somebody puts a marketing thing in and we pull it out, but, uh, pers you know, sort of marketing their business. But if you've got events or resources or things that you think the audience is interested in, by all means, throw them into the chat here. And as I said, then it gets captured and then it'll get republished. Um, as we go on further, but uh, it's really great to see the community organizing in this way. And uh, it's just, I think, again, one of these perverse benefits of an extraordinary human tragedy, global tragedy, is that we've just catapulted ourselves into a facility with these platforms, which is fantastic, and which I hope we never lose. And uh, all the more interesting for us to now have a panel about hospitality and tourism, because I think tourism um, and culture um, are changing. And, uh, and the mediums that we use are changing. And I'll be very interested to talk to these folks about that because they make their livelihoods about, uh, around people actually turning up somewhere, uh, coming from somewhere else uh, into Toronto or into Edmonton or into Ottawa or into Vancouver or wherever they're coming to, uh, to experience something that they can't experience by themselves. But also, you know, the big pivot, as we say, the term of, of COVID is pivot. One of the most significant pivots has been in the cultural sector as they've tried to find ways to express their creativity and bring that share that giftedness with us who, who are dependent on it to make us help us understand our lives and that we found new ways to do it. So it's gonna be so interesting, isn't it? As we reemerge and we get back into in-person things, how much of this collaborative uh, digital platforming will, re will resume? And I'll be interested to talk to our panelists about that. So, so this is on um, uh, tourism and culture and, and hospitality. And I, I think the hospitality sector too has just had an extraordinary knock. It's been referred to, for those of you on the session today who haven't been here prior, there have been many, many people talking about what's been happening to retail, what's happening to restaurants, what's happening to the workforces, how, how are we gonna restore the, the level of ec economic viability for these the purveyors of these products and services. And, um, and I also, I think of hospitality also in a, a more, a warmer way, that it's part of how cities welcome everyone else. Their newcomers are welcomed through hospitality. Visitors are welcomed through hospitality. And, and then folks like me who live in the city were part of the hospitality sort of matrix. So it's really uh, an important topic and how are we gonna recover that? It's also, I think, tied in with civility and how we're going to get back to making room for each other and understanding that we're different and that we have different priorities and different needs. And certainly the kinds of activities that your sector fosters brings you together with people that are not like you. And, uh, and so I think about that. I think about the, the functions in our society that I don't want to turn, I don't want to be completely uh, uh, operational here in terms of the role of culture, in terms of, of bringing us together. It has its own intrinsic value. But I also think about same with transit, things that bring you in contact with people that aren't like you and who don't have the same life experience. And you have some kind of an enlivened uh, experience by interacting with those folks in different kinds of ways. This is something we've lacked. And as we've been confined to barracks or we've been, or our lives have been made small, even if we were still going out to work, our lives have been made small. So here we are. I'm going to welcome, please, Beth Potter, Michael Rubinoff, Aaron Berenchman, and Tarin Nahar. Nayer, sorry, it's probably Nayer. Is it Tarin? How do you say your name? This, was that close yeah, enough? Yeah, correct, uh, correct. Okay. Yeah, Tarun Nair. Yeah, Nair. Great, great. Glad to have you, and glad to have uh, you folks to help us piece our way through this. Um, I was joking with uh, my colleagues that we did a playlist, Aaron. I know you've been very appreciative of this. We did a playlist for the summit playlist, and I just said to the gang, we should have had. Um, uh, welcome to the Rock as our leading into this session because Michael Rubinoff is with us and he's the he was the first um, producer of Come From Away and it's to it's the great Canadian story of a cultural phenomenon that uh, not only created a, a wonderful uh, theatrical experience for people but it also became an economic engine and uh, all the things that we know. Um, is that has the potential for the sector. So Beth, I'm delighted to have you because you bring the international piece to us about what's the viability of these. Um, communities as tourism destinations and what is that industry what is going on in the industry you're going to tell us all about that and Turin, really great to have you because you're place based and you're actually engaged in production in place in a specific kind of context and um, and how this has impacted you so I might actually go to you first if I could Turin, to just tell us a little bit about 
who you are and what your experience has been through COVID. And then I'll go around the, the room and, um, and get everybody else's perspective. So why don't you start? Yeah, thanks, Mary. So my name is Tarun Nair. You, you can call me T. And uh, I've been in the live music industry for my whole life, pretty much. I spent 15 years touring with my band, Delhi to Dublin, and I run a large South Asian festival. Um, we have a huge South Asian population, as you may know, in Vancouver and Surrey. So I run a festival that used to do in the old days, 10,000 people uh, to 15,000 people block party in June. Obviously, wow. things have changed a lot uh, now for the last couple of years. We haven't been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I also run a record label. So I would say I'm heavily invested with um, with the South Asian scene. And yeah, I mean, it's been absolutely heinous, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I think many folks in the music industry are kind of innately industrious and innovative. Um, just because of the nature of our work, it's always been a little unstable and we tend to be risk takers. That said, you know, even with all of the moves to... Um, to move online and to do a sort of more innovation around that. And we've done a lot from doing shows in the metaverse and doing shows in video games and whatnot to just the basic live streaming. Uh, it's still not the same and it's not the same in terms of revenue and it's not the same in terms of the feeling that we get after we put on an event. So happy to share more later. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I was in New Orleans after Katrina when the term resilient became the new term, you know? And uh, if you guys can remember when we didn't talk about resilience, well, that's when we started talking about it, it was in 2005. And a lot of people said, please stop calling us resilient because it was basically just another description of, well, you know, what else can you throw at us? So I think that's part of the dilemma with the cultural sector is, you know, they've, they're just tired of being the ones that are gonna be expected to, of course, they're gonna figure their way out of it, you know? And it's, uh, I, think that's, I think it's a profound question it's a really profound question because how we provide supports and which sectors of society get supports and how do we actually rationalize where those choices are made. It's a, I think it's a very difficult transition we're going to be in here um, as we recover, but also as we try to imagine building in resilience going forward. Beth, what's your perspective? I mean, you have a wide ranging membership, I'm sure, uh, big, small, the whole gamut, right? And they're all affected, right? So what's your sort of sense of, and I'm going to just invite all of you to turn your mics off, on, so that it can be more like a conversation. Like, don't feel you have to mute yourself unless you're like me and you have a puppy who's making a yak in the background. Just keep your mics open. It's much easier. Go ahead, Beth. Okay. Well, I have no puppies, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'm good. Um, so yeah, when we talk about tourism, um, we often talk about, you know, a suite of sectors. Our members are representative of everyone from the local restaurant down the corner that has four tabletops to Air Canada. I mean, mm -hmm. and everybody in between. And so it really is a suite of sectors. Um, we cover everything from seasonal, uh, to full-time year-round, inbound, outbound, um, activities that you do when you're here, accommodation, transportation, uh, you know, culture, live events, you know, it, 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 the whole gamut. And, um, and, and Tarin, I love, I love your reference to the old days. You know, I, I one time turned on the radio and there was an oldie station. It was playing all my favorite songs. <laughs> like the old days. When did this happen? <laughs> yeah, the old days is now 2019. <laughs> <laughs> um, a hundred years ago. <laughs> exactly, I know. So in the old days, tourism in this country was a hundred and five billion dollar a year industry and employed wow. two million Canadians. And we are half that now. And when um, you define and tourism, half Beth, struggling. <laughs> and, and and Beth, when you define tourism, do you mean it's not just people coming from offshore? I mean, I, I'm a tourist when I go to when I go to another province, or am I a tourist when I go to another city? Or am I both? You are a tourist when you travel 40 kilometers away from your home to oh, do really? something. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, we've, so been, we've all been promoting, you know, support local, get out and explore your neighborhoods, you know, support main streets. We've been, you know, that that is um, being a domestic tourist. It's interesting because tourism has a bit of a pejorative, you know, it's like, because there's bad tourists and bad tourism, you know, as opposed to visitor. I guess that's part of part of the shifting to the different language because tourist sounds as if you're extractive and you're you only go and then you take what you want and leave your garbage behind. You know what I mean? As opposed to visitor, which has a different kind of etiquette, I think, affiliated with it or something. But I'm very interested to hear that 40 kilometer rule. So, in fact, when it, when we resume a different kind of mobility, um, there will be a lot of us that will be 
considered visitors doing all sorts of things, right? Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we, you know, we do actually talk about it in terms of the visitor economy. And mm -hmm. um, we talk about what that means um, to different businesses within our suite of sectors. Mm -hmm. um, and some are focused very much on the domestic market. And so they're, they're looking at locals and or or at least Canadians. Um, mm -hmm. But other businesses are very much focused on the almost 97 million international travelers that we had in 2019 that came into the country. It, those people are, you know, they, they stay longer, they spend more money, they get into it, they're, 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 they're looking for those absolutely unique experiences. And, um, and they're, they're pretty precious to us. A hundred million visits, visits or visitors, visitors, visitor. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, we're going to have some questions about that because um, with climate and with the other kinds of challenges and the fact that people are out of the habit, I just wonder, are we going to be after another hundred million to come in like that on an annual basis? Or will we say, you know, maybe what we need is 60 million, but they come and stay longer. I don't know what the answer is on that, but I'm, I'm just drawing a comparison to what we're talking about with work from home. Um, one of the questions that was raised earlier in the session, one of the sessions was maybe people won't go downtown to work every day, uh, but maybe they'll go three times a week. And maybe when they go for those three times, they'll end up spending as much money as they did spend when they were used to come in five days a week. So I just an interesting kind of question of modal shifts and that kind of thing, you know, anyway, we'll come back to it. Aaron, talk to us about the constituency that you serve in the, uh, obviously Turin is part of it, but what are the broader issues that you're hearing around live music? And again, you've got big venues, small venues, right? Yeah, thanks, Mary. And I do have a puppy in the background and a couple of kids coming home from school. So apologies for any noise. Um, so the Canadian Live Music Association basically represents the broad ecology of the industry with the exception of artists. So we're really focused on the industry side. So promoters, festivals, clubs, uh, all, all the way from the small live music venue uh, to the major arenas and stadiums in the country and uh, all the folks in between. So the supply chain, which has been fundamentally <laughs> crushed in the last couple of years, but um, the folks who put the artists on the stage, the folks behind the stage, the folks in the box office, front of house, sound, lights, tech, production, that sort of thing. But our, really our core stakeholders are, are, the, are the folks who are putting the artists on the stage. And that was our focus pre-COVID really. Our association is only about seven, eight years old now. And uh, we were established to really start uh, telling the story of live music to express to government, you know, how big we were and uh, what kind of jobs we were creating our contribution to GDP and also organizing ourselves as an industry. We were not particularly united. Um, lots of uh, great entrepreneurs, very competitive, proprietary folks doing amazing work in their in their uh, own corners of uh, their universes, but um, enter COVID. And I like to call those, by the way, I call those the before times. So there were, that was the before times and now we're in COVID times and uh, enter COVID and truly an incredibly uh, uh, galvanizing um, call to action in terms of how will we survive? Um, and uh, the the, um, the way that we've come together is has been remarkable and has really allowed the association to lead um, on many, many pieces of this. And uh, I mean, I could talk for hours about the layers and layers and layers of impact um, and what and the ripple effects and what it will mean. I, I've, I, I'm, I'm very interested in focusing on, you know, the downtown piece, but uh, ultimately we've, we've seen an incredible contraction in the industry. We've lost many, many, many skilled workers. We've lost major companies who were suppliers. We will have situations um, potentially in the summer where we'll, we'll, we'll be back up on our feet in terms of being able to gather, but we won't have the, um, the production um, uh, capability to put on shows. And for those that, for that, for that gear that we need, the price will have gone exponentially through the roof, et cetera. So it's been a litany of issues, of challenges, and, but an incredible community. Uh, and talk about resilience, um, Mary, uh, really a, a amazing, amazing passion people, many of whom remarkably, and thanks to leadership from people like Beth Potter, I must say, who has done, uh, I hope I get a chance to come back to that, Beth, with, with uh, Susie Grine, all co-chairs of the Hardest Hit Coalition, helping lead many of us um, through this. Uh, but thanks to, to, to that work, um, are still standing remarkably and, and, and waiting through restrictions as we keep our fingers crossed on a, a, what we hope will be an imminent and full reopening. Yeah, people I don't know, they realize how interconnected your sectors are, right? So, Michael, I'm interested to talk with you because 
I was in New York for a number of years, and so I got to see, I knew that one of the campaigns that I was involved with was around the Garment District. Mm -hmm. It was a historic uh, employment district in, in New York City in Manhattan, and it had been there for decades, and it was largely immigrant-led uh, uh, and immigrant-run, and it, it was in all those old tenement buildings, right? And it was, that was where the button makers were and the peacemakers were, and the, you know, it's the famous shots of people pushing uh, um, hangers of clothing, you know, those, that's the Garment District, and it really did have a kind of geographical proximity to it. it was like an ecosystem. And then when um, uh, Manhattan started to gentrify and all of a sudden high-end hotels and restaurants were moving in, it disrupted the garment district, but it didn't just disrupt the fashion industry, it disrupted Broadway. Because any place that when, a, if you're running a, a preview of Come From Away and you know how this works, if a director uh, looks at the preview and says, you know what, the dancing uh, shoes are all the wrong color, go get those dyed blue tonight, they would go into the garment district and that's where it would happen. And similarly, all the amateur uh, uh, companies or non nonprofit theater companies that were operating or whatever else, they all became part of it. So it's just this interconnectedness. And I'm sure that's part of the story of Come From Away that uh, when David Mervish announced that it had to be disrupted. And as we've seen in these different economies, and I'm, true, and I'm sure that's true in, in terms of your festival, your folks do all sorts of other gigs when they're not in the festival. And the same is true in these uh, centers. People have a gig with the National Arts Center and then they're doing something on the side. And oh, then they also have an entrepreneurial business where they're stitching something else together. So from your perspective as a producer, and I think you're an educator as well, um, do you want to comment a bit about uh, how do we sort of re-stitch back in as we recover um, the role of these cultural entities and these and this cultural capacity, I guess, um, because it's an economic thing, but it's also an it's also a social connected thing, right? Very much so. And Aaron brings up a very good point. It, it's about people and uh, people in our industry hurting right now. Um, you know, we've been subject to capacity limits up and down, closures up and down. And when we look at government programs, I like to say invest versus support, but government programs investing in arts and culture, we have had a misstep. You know, programs, federal programs like tourism and hospitality, those are geared towards income supports for employees. And I, we need to remind levels of government that arts workers you know, the people that make the art, the people that support the art are independent contractors, are, you, you know, um, a Kate freelance workers on crews. And if we're going to rebuild this ecology, we got to do a number of things. If we do have those supports, A, we need them now. We can't wait till April or we need retroactivity. We need to make sure we open those supports so that when we do come back, just like Aaron's industry, we have that experience. Those crews are so integral. Those actors are so integral. They have been out of work going on almost two years that we're going to lose them. So this is so important in terms of the supports. That also goes to opening a door where we've seen income supports for, you know, a, a universal income for artists that is now bubbling mm -hmm. up. Ireland is going in this direction. San Francisco has gone in this direction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time we discuss that as we want to look at our artists living in our downtown towns and living in our cities and all of the challenges that are surrounding that how are we going to support them we cannot lose them to create that work at our from our smallest theaters to our largest theaters and i just want to make one point we look at come from away as this juggernaut and what happened to us and that we couldn't get government support you know today there are four companies have come from away running in sydney on broadway on tour in north america and london we we need to open that support and we need to our government needs to aim with the same engagement investments we've done for film and television, and obviously the great work that started in music. When we get behind that as Canadians, what we do for our downtowns and our cities is extraordinary, but we need that now for the live performance industry. So let's talk about that for a sec, because you just made an interesting question, a point about if you're an employee. So if you're an employee and the relief went to the employer, which we know it did, the Canadian emergency wage subsidy was an incentive for employers to keep people employed, don't lay them off. And in fact, we were hearing it in the restaurant sector all the time that the cost of laying folks off and then you don't get them back, free training, better to actually lay them off on salary. But if you are in a creative industry and you're not an employee and you maybe don't ever want to be an employee, like some of it is choice. I, I worry a little bit that we've, we've created this pejorative around the gig economy. Lots of people choose it. Not everybody does, but there are people that choose it. And part of the creative industry is you move from this to this, to this, to this. So is the option 
um, a universal basic income? And is it, and maybe it's only not just for artists. We had on the previous session, people saying, why aren't we looking at a new, we, we basically have had a universal basic income for the last two years. That's in, in, in effect what CERB was and should we keep it on? What do people think? I'll pass to somebody else. Yes, for me. <laughs> yes, for you. Beth, what do you think? Listen, we are um, in a situation where we've seen, you know, um, some of our most precarious groups um, affected even harder than others in this mm -hmm. um, throughout this pandemic. And so would a basic income help us to um, level the playing field for women, for new Canadians, for young workers? Absolutely, it would. As a stabilizer, really. It's a stabilizer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. The other thing it does is create a, a, a hopefully an opportunity that hasn't been entirely lost for artists who are emerging into the space and will choose to work in under certain conditions. Um, it is hardly a lucrative. Uh, no, nobody gets to... nobody gets rich on these things. Like it's just right. I don't know where people have that perception, but we, we know anecdotally. I mean, they did do a basic income pilot in Ontario, for instance, and then we know anecdotally that people that benefited from it ended up doing exactly as you're suggesting, Erin, they took on something new or it gave them an opportunity to actually cultivate something. And then what we don't know, because it didn't carry on very long, is, is there a way that people then end up earning more than the, than the basic income that's provided to them? And then it, eventually the basic income is no longer required because they're earning a salary some other way, right? It's a curious. Yeah, I think ultimately part of this conversation is connected to the legitimization of arts and culture and how we value them as a society. I mean, once and for all, I mean, if one more person tells me, oh, music played, you know, it's been played such a fundamental role in, in our in our mental health and healing during the pandemic. Well, you know what? Um, that's great. Yeah. And I agree. And for me, too. Uh, but we really, really, really need to take a hard look at the types of of cultural and fiscal policy that's being developed at every level of government. We're talking about downtowns and we have an incredible, incredible opportunity before us before chunks of our cultural infrastructure fall into the wasteland forever, uh, much more expensive to rebuild than to maintain at this well, point. Well, can we talk life. about that? Can we talk about that? Because cultural yeah. infrastructure, as you suggest, iconic cultural infrastructure is critically important to downtowns around the world. So do you, do you in each of your cities have a concern about that? Do you think that we need to be looking carefully at the actual built environment. I mean, are we going to lose some of these theaters? Are we going to be losing some of these yes. museums? Are we, we are, okay. I have two concerns. One is the infrastructure. There's definitely okay. that concern that we need funds to renovate, to make them more accessible, to make them more open. That is a, that is a current need. The second need around infrastructure is the evictions. You know, we yep. saw that in the distillery uh, district with a number of companies that found their 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 footing, their foundation, built their culture, built their audience, and then they're moved out. So, you know, I think infrastructure, we look at it in two ways in the downtowns. So let's talk a little bit about the opportunism of this, though. I mean, we've been involved with Why Not Productions and the Metcalf Foundation funded us to do a, a, a piece of work on meanwhile leases, that if you're going to have empty space, why not find ways to make, you know, deal with the insurance and find ways to make it available as rehearsal space, because it's a benefit to the creative who gets, who needs access to that space. It's a benefit to the landlord because something's happening in their building. It's also a benefit if it's at the street level to people passing by, because all of a sudden something is going on in there. So I, we had, you know, Michael Emery at Allied was one of our opening speakers yesterday. He's one of the sponsors of this. And he's a guy who takes old buildings and turns it into a commercial space. But it's interesting to talk to those folks about how do we actually promote this kind of suggestion you're making, which is adaptive reuse. Calgary had 400 empty office floors before COVID. Somebody on the chat is going to know and is going to write in what Deborah reported, the head of the Calgary Chamber reported today, um, at the, what her vacancy rate is. I think it's something like 35%. Anybody on the chat remember? I think it was. So there are empty spaces out there. Is there a way for the creative industry? And, it, and do we need to create some tax incentive? I don't know. I'm asking my policy people to listen mm. for that. Um, that would make that easier so that rehearsal space would be available. Creative space would be available. Well, it, it, Mary, absolutely. Meanwhile, we're losing those spaces in Toronto. Uh, it, it's fundamental, especially to the whole music cities approach. Are we losing that, it to housing? What are we losing it to? That's a good question. Um, uh, I wish Mark Garner were on this panel. He might talk about what what uh, Mark's in the lost. chat. Mark's in the chat. He can he can throw in his comments in the chat. I you see know, him there. Other mm -hmm. businesses, perhaps, uh -huh. uh, okay. uh, with with deeper pockets um, in prime real estate. But um, 
I, you know, I think the the opening up uh, opening up of space downtown creates a great opportunity because if we don't have creatives creating in the downtown space, we, you know, we don't have the option to share that content ultimately. It's well, one of the, oh, to the I mean, one of the things that the chamber guys were talking about too is that they're reading about how businesses are having to sweeten the pot to get workers to come back. You know, you can't just, it's not like the old days where the employer says you that you will come back. Some workforces say, uh, I don't think so. So they have to find ways to entice them to come back. And it's workers though, because okay. these are downtown cores to attract the international visitor. And some right. of those international visitors are, you know, they're there on business. They're coming in for business events. Right. And right. we know that when international you know, events come in, international investment soon follows. And so, you know, if we don't have activated downtown cores with cool, interesting things to do, telling our story as, as Canada, then mm -hmm. we're missing an element there on that side as well. Mm -hmm. Tarain, what's your experience when you've been looking, I mean, you've curated and you've been part of large scale and small scale. Do you see an opportunity through this to cultivate, for instance, more neighborhood, more, more smaller scale initiatives? And if we don't, if we do, we have an opportunity to do that. Mark has put into the chat um, that in for downtown Young for the BIA there, he's focusing on art and cultural activities to get people back to Young Street. Do you see that as a niche? I don't know if we want to call it a niche, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm finding this whole discussion fascinating. It's so hard to. I, I just find so many times during this pandemic, I've tried to predict what's going to happen next yeah. and what the right way forward is, and it just. Uh, you know, at this point, I'm just like, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I know that Surrey, at least, has lost one in 25 of their downtown businesses. And I know that there's many more that are threatened right now um, and are just subsisting on government support. And mm -hmm. you can see that when you're driving around in Surrey. You can definitely see that when you're driving around downtown Vancouver. Uh, I don't know if, you know, going to get a Subway sandwich is going to get me out of bed and into downtown. But if there was a cool outdoor festival, that would certainly be interesting. But that kind of depends on... Um, that kind of depends on there being the possibility to gather in large numbers again, which mm -hmm. I know everyone is really expecting to happen maybe by March, maybe by April. I am still on the fence. You're going to believe it when you see it. Well, but <laughs> exactly. what about, I mean, but, but the other question is, I mean, could we, can we gather outdoors? That's the interesting, I mean, I guess that's one question, but as certainly as the nicer weather approaches, but also, and again, you know, some of the business advocates, I'm sure you have them in your memberships are saying, no, no, we have to just equip ourselves. So we, we can't shy away again. We have to find ways to be so that we can be uh, safe and that we have all the, the necessary uh, provisions that we need in terms of air filters or whatever the heck it is. And, and that we don't stop uh, functioning. We find a way to function in a safer way. I guess that's a challenge for uh, the cultural sector. And I actually don't know how the numbers work. I, I went to the ballet and uh, I was looking at the hall thinking, I have no idea how anybody is making this work financially, well, uh, right? Like, I don't can know. I, I just can't imagine. Go ahead. Well, I did this. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Beth. No, I was. I, I was going to agree. I mean, I think that from you know, there are some some great things happening in other jurisdictions around the world that we can be learning from. Um, and I was just looking at Jeff's comment um, in the chat where he talks about you know you know the difference between how we value um, our arts and culture um, and our artists here in Canada and and how they're valued in other places around the world. We're all willing to fork out seven bucks for a coffee at Starbucks, but we shy away when it's like five bucks to go into a bar to hear a band. Well, mm -hmm. you know, th there's a there's a huge difference there. And, and I mean, how many people, if you've got any kind of skill, oh, can you take my picture for free? Oh, can you yeah. do this for me for free? Oh, it's like, why? You, you're, you wouldn't ask me to lobby for you for free, would you? Because I'm not going to do it. So why mm -hmm. would I expect? But but I know, I bet you know these are things that we've struggled with forever. And I'm trying to figure out how do you come out of the how do you come out of the COVID? How do you come out of the pandemic with a different? You you've got a moment because people know what they people appreciate what they've missed. So, so they might be willing to pay for it. Go ahead, Michael. So create the climate to to stimulate that. So we've seen that in film. So through tax credits where you can get some commercial investment or stimulate commercial investment. In terms of valuing arts and culture, when you're in Australia, the Premier of New South Wales and the Premier of Victoria fight over who can support a musical better to get the Australian Premier 
of mm -hmm. that show. You know, mm -hmm. the premiere of Victoria came to Broadway, stood outside our theater for Come From Away and was proud to announce we would start in Melbourne. It's a different way that culture is valued. And I think we have to look at things that have worked very well for the film industry, also working with landlords so that we can have incentives to provide that space. And, you know, I'll just say, you know, art, it encompasses so many different things. You know, dance companies are looking for venues, immersive theater. You know, we got to get people away from the computer. We got to bring them down. There is a creative, interesting way we can use our city and our city's spaces if we, if we, will, if we have the will to come together with our government, privately, not-for-profits, and try and navigate this so i'd this like to hear I'd, I'd like to hear more about what those instruments are again we're doing a wrap-up session in a couple of hours about what the instruments need to be and what do we need more research on and one of them would be it seems to me what would the tax levers be you know what would it take to get as you're just suggesting the idea that beth they come in they visit and then it actually leads to foreign investment that's interesting like are there ways to we also we do also know this that a recruiting talent uh, to get the folks that are really capable on certain kinds of things are often the same people who are high consumers of, of culture. I don't, there's not a straight line there, but there's something about that. That, uh, And it's similarly, we have old buildings. We know that creatives, for whatever set of reasons, like old buildings. So are there ways for us to do adaptive reuse differently? We've been pushing this around, should we have more housing in downtown? Uh, and can we convert some of those office buildings into housing? What about um, cultural spaces? Should we be repurposing spaces that may not get occupied by commercial use or some other use? Could they be permanent performance spaces or permanent cre creative spaces? I mean, we've all been to these Van Gogh, Hugh, no, we have not all, but I've been to a couple of these and they're extraordinary and they were unbelievably opportunistic. And I was really glad for it, frankly, because I felt very deprived of any kind of stimulation. And I really enjoyed the piece that I saw and it was immersive in an old building, right? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if we could say, you know, all of those office towers in downtown Toronto where the tenants had, you know, t stripped out all of the offices and they've gone for this big open workspace and now nobody's there working. You've got a great big open artistic yeah. space that could be used. And what yeah. value do they bring? Does that bring to to the building, to the neighborhood, um, and, and not just in dollars, like, you know, not in direct dollars, like what are the, what's the ripple effect? Um, and, and can we start valuing things in a different way? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that it comes, I mean, all of these ideas are great. I mean, there's a million things that we can and should be doing. Forget about COVID. It's like, there's, we just haven't valued the, the work to the extent. And I'm talking about all arts, not just live music. One of the things I'm really interested in exploring are like collaborations. I know you're saying it's a theme, Mary. I heard it said yesterday and again today here. Uh, we need to expand our collaborative effort uh, with both the usual and unusual suspects, especially in live music. I think corporate Canada could be playing a more significant leadership role um, because we know creative cities attract talent, um, adds to you know city brand building. Um, tourism, all the things. There are there there are some great examples I have in the that have surfaced in the last couple of years. Of one example, Canaxis, a visionary CEO, John Sicard, based here in Ottawa, who's been working with our association not only to help artists directly, but to come up with creative ways of of uh, of uh, integrating his his the ethos of his company into the work uh, that we do. But it's important primarily because what he's recognized is that he Canaxis, a company that has that has thrived during the pandemic has a responsibility and a direct relationship to the work that we do. And he's standing up and, and saying, you know, how can I help? And we've been finding amazing ways. And it's not all always about money. Um, so I'm really interested in exploring some of these relationships. And, and uh, also, I think what will be elemental to this is uh, reducing red tape. And I hate to simplify it down to that one sentence, but making it easier for things to happen, um, whether it's a little things, big things, indoors, outdoors, it can be very, very complicated to actually put on a festival and working with municipalities, I think, is, is the way forward on that and really sort of freeing up um, uh, some of these events to actually go forward when we need so them. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, we talked, we had sessions yesterday on anchor institutions in downtown. Some, your session is being followed by one on the role of universities. Um, but we had one, whoops, uh, we had one, uh, two yesterday, one dealing with libraries and one dealing with churches, faith institutions. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, um, the stewards of those facilities, uh, one was from New York and they were in from different, and one was from Halifax, one was from California, uh, from Calgary. They were talking about using their venues as um, uh, convening spaces for cultural activity. And they cited it right off the bat. And uh, the convener of that session on faith institutions, Graham Singh, 
runs something called Trinity Centers Foundation, and he has a circus that literally a circus that has uh, partnered with him in his congregation. So they rehearse in the nave of that church and then they perform and the cute, the pews have been converted into bar stools, I think. And then, you know, it's a, it's, it's a place to, and there's a trapeze at the top. I've been in it. It's a trapeze at the top of the nave. And on a Saturday night, you're there having a cocktail and watching these fantastic contortionists who I suspect are a feeder company into Cirque du Soleil, again, an unbelievably successful business that created a bunch of other spinoffs. And then the, and then the next day they worship there. So these kinds of creative uses of spaces uh, and how do we motivate people to just say yes. This is the one thing about COVID that I think has been good is that because there was some urgency, we tried some stuff. I get a bit anxious about us swinging back to normal where we go back to being polite Canadians saying no all the time. We can't, we can't afford to, we have yeah. to look at different ways. And, and, and it's not just, um, it's not just as a means of survival, but it's also, you know, as Canadians, as travelers around the world, we're seeing uh, people's um, wants and desires change for what they want to see as well. You mm-hmm. know, this, this pandemic has not just been, oh, stay at home and work from your dining room table or your extra mm-hmm. bedroom. This has fundamentally changed the way we all interact with each other. Um, and so we have got to find different ways of interacting with our, our clients, um, whether they are going to a live music event, whether they're going to the theater, whether they're getting on a gondola and going up the side of a mountain, whatever it is that they're doing, we have to find a, a different way of engaging with them because they are different people now and so Mm -hmm. um and and we're and 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 way more savvy around technology than we were two years ago as well yep that's why i i've I've been thinking over the last five minutes or so how important it will be as we try to convince people to come back to downtown centers to integrate those kinds of ideas in not just to go back not not going back to business as usual but um, you know, I think municipal governments can play a role. Like I've been watching as bike lanes have expanded dramatically in Vancouver because there's just been this land grab by the city of Vancouver. They're like, okay, people aren't driving as much. We can set up bike lanes. We can make parklets. Um, I think that's fantastic. I think we should shut down a couple of the main arteries in Vancouver and turn them into pedestrian only. That's great. We have built-in venues everywhere. But along with that is communicating that effectively on social media, on TikTok, on, you know, on the, like, like, you know, sort of web three metaverse type applications of what we're doing so that there is the ability for people who are still scared to gain up their confidence by watching and participating, you know, through technology until they get the confidence to get up, you know, get on the bus and, and, and come back downtown. I mean, one of the, the important things I would think about this sector, this whole question of culture and hospitality and tourism is that it, it it's, it's by its definition diverse. So it, it, it appeals to different kinds of folks and it reflects different kinds of experience. This is not a particularly diverse panel. And I'm concerned about how do we make sure that the cultural renaissance that let's hope may, touch and wood there, may emerge here is actually reflective of the diversity of Canada and the diversity of the different cultural communities that exist. And also that, it, that we continue to see culture as a way to have tough conversations and to have and express some of the difficulties that we have around racism and exclusion and all those things. Thoughts on that in terms of coming out of COVID, how much of, of that reconciliation can be addressed through culture, how much of that we can bridge across differences? Well, so first of all, we are, we've got a massive labor shortage and the only way and across industries, this is not just in, you know, in one sector at all, at all. And the only way that we're going to um, be able to meet the needs that we have as, you know, people in, in jobs is through immigration. Mm -hmm. And so we are going to have to throw open our doors. We're going to have to be um, uh, far more encouraging of, um, uh, you know, this collaboration of, of, of people coming together. And we're going to have to encourage immigration to, to blend into the country outside of the big city centers. Like they're going to have to get into the smaller towns and the smaller main streets. Um, and that, that, that will, that will begin a ripple of, of, uh, of, as you say, reconciliation. And then of course, with indigenous, I mean, you know, the indigenous tourism was the biggest growing sector of our industry prior to COVID. 
because people want to know they want to they want to get they want to hear the stories they want to experience um and 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 touch you know the 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 real tangible uh, stories that in the Indigenous uh, peoples of Canada can can share with. with well, them. and I mean, and I immediately get worried about that that it becomes extracted again. But I, mm-hmm. but I hear you. I mean, all these things have to be led by the at the ground, and hopefully uh, they're uh, led by the communities themselves. And mm-hmm. uh, I appreciate what you're saying about immigration and newcomers. But we've also got populations across the country, um, uh, people of color, communities of color. And may is there an opportunity, for instance, if we have this abundance of space? Is there some way for your sector to prioritize accessibility of those spaces to um, performers of color and performers that are coming out of cultural communities? And why wouldn't that be one of our goals coming out of this so that we don't just make room for the, uh, for the already successful mainstream performer, but we actually make sure that we're cultivating this kind of m- wider mix. Aaron, I'm sure, Aaron, you must have this because many, many, many musicians and you, you, you have a very, very diverse constituency in your, li- in your uh, sector. Yeah, I'd like to actually let Tarun jump in. I was feeling like you had something to say on the tip of your tongue because I can talk about what Tarun knows what we're working on in our, in our organization. But do you want to go first and then I can add on? I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but yes, Mary, this is definitely an opportunity. Uh, we're, we've done some extremely exciting work at the Canadian Lab Music Association around this closing the gap study. And I, I don't think I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to release any of the information, but it's absolutely shocking. And I think one of the most shocking discrepancies between, let's say, white live industry, uh, live music industry workers and non-white uh, impact industry workers is that almost all of the impact workers are artists. So I don't think it's just about giving performers access. Yeah, that's a good point. It's about giving organizations access and funding organizations, because as long as all of the gatekeepers in the country are white, as they are. Um, yep. we're not going to see change. Like as much as, you know, as much as we, we, we would hope that people would out of the goodness of their heart, move aside and leave room for others. That is not actually what happens. And we don't see that happening. It turns out that most white live music workers think their organizations are diverse and doing a good job at diversifying. Um, but actually most impact workers at those, or those organizations do not agree with that sentiment. So I, I feel in situations like this, um, active disruption is needed. And I don't mean a revolution, but I do mean a revolution in the way that we're funding things and providing access. And I absolutely think this is a, this is a good point at which to do this. And all of us who hold power uh, have the responsibility to push, not only to make room, but also to push governments for these changes to be made so we can actually see some progress. It's been too long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, this is part of these tax instruments instruments that are maybe made available to us. We we administer at CUI, the Healthy Communities Initiative with Community Foundations of Canada and My Main Street. Uh, both of these are funded by the government of Canada and they have explicit equity deserving community priorities. And, uh, you know, that's a real challenge for white organizations to be responsive to this. It's not easy and we don't get it right a lot of the time. And uh, so I'm just interested as we come out of this, can we somehow double down in terms of our commitment of allyship and all that? thing um okay so we only got a couple more minutes left go ahead somebody's going to say something i was just gonna i was just gonna add on the study that Trina is talking about is called closing the gap and it's going to be released by the canadian live music association in, in within a month and uh well it, you know COVID gave us this opportunity to really excel and prioritize uh accelerate rather and prioritize this conversation and we know that the, you know no one is would ever say that the live music industry was the healthiest highest functioning uh, industry and in, like I mean certainly not and it really really did give us an opportunity to dive into this work it's just so elemental and um, I think at this moment in our history um, you know before times being what they were it's our responsibility to really really springboard off some of this research but the, the research is just a starting line right like it's just a starting line it's what comes after that matters and we're hoping to set the tone for the next several years with government and community together I think when we look back on this Uh, on the pandemic, I'm really optimistic. One of the things we'll be able to point to is this moment um, when it comes to really diversifying our industry and hopefully others. If I can comment on that too, I mean, it's the same, you know, in live performance, these are the same issues. And this is why it's so critical as we see young people who are leading on these issues and leading for the call for diversity and opening up those gates, we need to make sure they're supported. So this is where we come back, you know, to that 
you know, basic income, these wage supports, because we don't want to lose those people. That, that's one of my biggest fears, that we, we are going to lose some people that we really, really need uh, in our industry to, to help change and evolve and tell their stories. So I think the point here is that it ain't going to be easy, right? I mean, we're, we're all champions of this in critical ingredient um, that makes downtown life and makes urban life worth living, frankly. And it's important, it's important to, obviously from an economic point of view, but it's important to an employment point of view, important from an equity point of view. And it's just important in terms of the vibrancy and vitality and viability of downtown cores. So thank you for joining us and thanks for challenging us. Um, you know, the conversation is never over, as we say, this is just the beginning and uh, we're not going to let go of this. We feel really strongly that and, and actually, I think in this case, the federal minister actually is very sympathetic to a lot of what we're talking about. So there may be a window here uh, in terms of doing this differently and valuing things differently. And certainly as we recover, we've got to think of really um, imaginative ways to invest differently. So thank you for helping provoke us. Uh, Turin, lovely to meet you. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you and be on this. And I want Come From Way to come back. I'm going to, I'm one of those people that would be a multi-goer if I, if there were a show for me to go to see. Aaron, always great to see you. And Beth, nice to see you again. Thanks for joining us. We're going to take a 15 minute break. This is our last break. Uh, so enjoy it. That playlist will record. You can get it on Spotify. And uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some tangible things that are going on in universities and why they're uh, important to actually bringing back downtowns. And then we're going to talk about actions on the ground uh, from Los Angeles and from New York and from other cities across the country. So thanks for joining us. See you back here in 15 minutes. Thanks, gang, for being part of the session. Thanks, Mary. Thank, Thank you. you.